Can we fly in heaven? Are there animals <laughs> and pets in heaven? Are there sports in heaven? Can people sin in heaven? And more uh, personally, how does belief in heaven help us grieve loss? These are just a few of the questions that are on your mind and my mind. We're going to explore them today. I don't know anybody better on the planet to wrestle with questions and help us wrestle with questions on heaven than our guest today, Randy Alcorn. Randy, this is your third time back. Really appreciate every time you carve out. Your big book, Heaven, is just masterful. But you have this new book that I'm showing right here called The Promise of the New Earth that in some ways takes all this research you've done, all this thinking, and says, here's quick, practical responses to big questions about heaven. Wonderful book. I hope our audience will pick it up. But thanks for carving out the time, and I'm looking forward to tackling this with you. Hey, great to be with you, Sean, always. Well, it's been in the news publicly. Your wife, Nancy, a number of months ago passed away. And I know a question you've been asked is how your belief in heaven in particular frames this. So first off, super sorry and you know, about your loss. Appreciate your willingness to share that struggle publicly. But having written a book on heaven and then your wife passes from cancer, how did it help you process this tragedy? Well, Sean, it helped a great deal and continues mm -hmm. to help every day. It also helped that Nancy and I, uh, not just for the last few years since she was diagnosed with cancer, but for decades have discussed heaven, the new earth. Nancy had, she came up with this term herself. He, she says, here's my new earth bucket list. Uh, because wow. we don't, you know, we've talked about this, you know, if you understand the world to come, the resurrected world, not, not just the present heaven where you go when you die, that's prior to the resurrection, but the heaven that is the future heaven that God will bring down to the new earth, which is what this book is about. Then you realize, okay, uh, I don't have to have a bucket list here. I mean, uh, fine, if you have a list of things you want to do before you die, I mean, that's fine. But lots of times people's idea is that's, uh, that's, this is all there is. This is our only chance to be in bodies on an earth. Well, it's not our only chance. It's our first chance. Mm -hmm. And this earth as it now is, is under the curse. And one day we will live on a new earth that won't be under the curse. It'll be glorious in every way. So what it does for me is I go, well, I'm going to be reunited with Nancy when I die. But then together one day after the resurrection, and a lot of us believe in a, a thousand year uh, reign of Christ on the old earth. But after that, there's another rebellion. And then comes new heavens and new earth. And God brings the present heaven down to the new earth. And Nancy and I will... Uh, be part of colonizing that new earth with all of God's people. And uh, I, that every day I front load that eternal reality into my present day life mm. and it changes everything. Randy, let me ask you one more question on this before we move to sports and, and heaven and some of these common questions that we have. You ended that by saying you download that kind of to the front of your life. Does that mean that it's easy, even though you've read a book on this, to forget the truth of heaven? Does that mean even when your wife was struggling with cancer, your emotions would give you a sense of doubt and you had to remind yourself of this truth to bring yourself back? How, do you, how does the truth of heaven, I'm asking, help us deal when we emotionally struggle with things? What does that look like in practice? Well, for, for me, Sean, it's very much, people will often talk about the hope of heaven. And I really don't like that word hope. Now, the, hmm. the word is in the Bible, but what the word means, um, you know, that's what appears in our English translations. But the word in the original is way more than wishful thinking. Like, I hope someday uh, to go to Paris, or I hope someday uh, to be a quarterback in the NFL. Or, you know, there's a lot of wishful thinking types of hopes that will never be realized in people's lives. Um, but in Scripture, this is a blood-bought hope. This is an assured, certain matter. of We call it a matter of faith, but that faith, as Hebrews 11 makes so clear, is, is, is a certainty about things unseen. It is a, 
uh, a reality. So in my life, um, and, and maybe I, I'm, I, I've thanked the Lord that I've been able to do all this research over the years, to, to have written a big book on heaven and several smaller books, to have written on the problem of evil and suffering, if God is good, to have written on the, these other things, and to have written on happiness. Um, it all has come together my life, in my life in this grieving process. Because, you know, if you're thinking about the world to come, the resurrection, being with Jesus, reunited to our loved ones, if you're thinking about uh, God being the ultimate answer to the problem of evil and suffering and Jesus with the scarred hands, and you're talking about the eternal happiness, then you can front load that into your life today and say, okay, these are the promises of God. They are certain. Mm -hmm. And he paid an eternal at an eternally efficacious price for us. I, I love that idea of front loading it. One of the leading resurrection scholars in the world, you know, Gary Habermas has studied the resurrection right. more than anybody. And his wife, a number of years ago, his first wife before he's remarried passed of cancer. And he mm. said it was the truth of the resurrection that when his emotions were leading him astray, he would talk about it and pray on it and meditate on it and help bring his emotions back in line to trust God, not blindly, but reasonably. As an apologist, I often talk about how faith is not blind. It's trusting in God in light of what we have reason to believe is true. Well, you're saying the same is the case with hope, that it's not just blind. It's a grounded hope in light of what Scripture teaches. So let's start here. What gives you that hope? How do you know that heaven is real? Well, I certainly trust the words of Scripture, and when a lot of people hear that, they think, well, that, that's kind of naive. That's that leap of faith. It's not naive at all. Um, I know the reality of Jesus in my life. Uh, he is my best friend. Um, he is Nancy's best friend, and she's with my best friend, and I'm here with my best friend. And Nancy and I aren't together but we share in common uh, our Savior, who's our best friend. And that's what John 15 says. Jesus said, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. There's a tenderness, there's an intimacy uh, to his presence in my life. So uh, I know it because God's word says it, but it's m more than that, not, not better than that. But in addition to that is the actual life experience, call it subjective, there's objective truth and there's subjective truth, but boy, we need both. And when it, you're talking about walking with God, sensing the presence of Jesus and his love and his friendship in my, my life, and Nancy did in her dying days, having our family gather around her deathbed and her speaking to the lives of our grandchildren, then me read to them from her journal when her voice uh, could go on no longer. Uh, it has just been an incredibly spiritual uh, experience and, and and it's just it, it it has the ring of truth it is true it's a reality i really appreciate you sharing, you sharing the importance of scripture and the lived experience with jesus i was asked on a panel at i think it was uci university of california irvine why i believe in afterlife and i pointed to the passage of john where jesus says I'm preparing a place for you to his disciples dies and comes back. I said, look, if you want to know if China's real, talk to someone who's been there and comes back. Right. If somebody is dead, <laughs> comes back on the third day, prepares a place for us, it means heaven is real. So I think we can know this experientially, but I think the evidence points towards Jesus rising from the grave that makes this large cumulative Amen. case that's Amen. powerful. So. What do you make of some of these stories like heaven is real when people point towards not the scripture itself, the experience you're talking about, but kind of these near death experiences as proof that heaven is real? Well, I think we need to be cautious. Um, I, I'm not even going to name names, but I was on, I was on a panel one time uh, with uh, J.I. Packer. And on the other side of me was someone who had had one of these experiences. I believe the man was sincere. He's a pastor. He wrote one of the earliest books uh, that sold millions of, of copies, uh, and there have been several since, um, on, on his uh, memories of having been in heaven. I don't think he's lying. I, mm -hmm. I have no doubt that he is a, a, a godly man. However, um, 
when people recount these experiences, remember that um, uh, what is, what's a dream, what's a reality, uh, they're normally under very heavy medication. Um, how is that affecting their impressions? Uh, there's just so many subjective elements to this. So uh, if God wants to bring somebody home to heaven and then send them back to earth, that's not the normal way of things, but God can do all kinds of things that aren't normal. So I'm not questioning whether it can happen. I am questioning whenever what they recount does not line up with scripture mm. and and probably heaven is for real is the be best known one of those where the the young boy uh you know dies uh and goes to heaven and uh, you know shares his memories of it and he talks about uh, rainbow colored unicorns in the present heaven mm. um no such thing as unicorns or rainbow you know covered unicorns and and even if there were, probably the present heaven wouldn't exactly be the place for them. Well, that's okay. I mean, I guess that's possible. But then he talks about how people have these circles above their heads. He's saying about people, and people have wings there. So he's not talking about angels. Not even all angels have wings, but people never have wings. I mean, there, there's not a passage in Scripture where people have wings, and nobody is said to have the circles, the halos, you know, over their head. I mean, that just is, that that's medieval art. And so when there's page after page that has things like that, I, I just say, well, I don't know. Whatever you do, don't, um, it can be an interesting story and an interesting movie, but don't base what you believe uh, uh, about heaven just on people's subjective accounts and memories. And there was, by the way, one best-selling book uh, that a boy, another boy wrote, uh, where he later admitted that he made up the whole thing. And, uh, a, a publisher, one of my publishers, uh, wisely and immediately took it off the market. And, uh, all you can buy now is used copies of it. And I would rec I would recommend you don't buy those. <laughs> well, that was one of my publishers too. So I appreciated that they pulled it down. Right. You know, me, yeah. when I speak about what what they can prove is when someone has a near-death experience, maybe they're drugged up, medically dead, comes back with information we can confirm that they couldn't have known in that physical state. That minimally tells me consciousness continues and we're not just bodies. But that doesn't prove that the soul is eternal. It doesn't prove heaven. So when somebody gives, like you said, ideas that contradict scripture, that's a huge pause. Now, I think the book by John Burke, Imagine Heaven, is interesting, where he fills in some details mm -hmm. that if they line up with Scripture, they right. might give us a fuller sense. Yes. But I think some caution there is really wise. All right. Let's jump into the big questions people have, and I'm going to just play the skeptic for fun. Randy, how on earth is heaven going to be fun? Isn't it going to be boring? There's no chance of loss. There's no risk. Where's the drama and enjoyment in heaven? <laughs> Yeah, and I see why we think this way. I mean, I've written uh, 10 novels or so, and mm -hmm. stories, you know, have to have conflict, problems, uh, animosity, um, people enjoy murder mysteries. I mean, uh, all of these, these things that are part of this life, we imagine for a story to be interesting, um, that this would have to be in there. But I think what we fail to realize is we will not lose our memory of the challenges of this life. Uh, we will not lose our memories of sin and what sin was and what sin did. We will forever rejoice in the adventures that will be ours on a new earth. And I think a lot of times the reason people think it will be boring is because they fail to understand what scripture says. Uh, in Ephesians 2, 7, it says, in the ages to come, God will be revealing unto us the wonders and riches of his grace and kindness in Christ Jesus. He will be revealing to us a future ongoing thing that he will be doing. Well, it means we're going to be learning. And a lot of people think, and I had a conversation with somebody just this last week on this. Uh, so, well, of course, when we die, we'll know everything. We go, well, no, we won't know everything. 
Only God knows everything. We don't become omniscient. We don't become God when we die. We will be creatures forever, and creatures don't know everything and never will know everything. We So think of heaven as this great learning process. And again, a lot of people don't think about the physical bodies, the meaning of resurrection, the fact that Christ said seven or eight times in the Gospels that in his kingdom, and, and I take it primarily he means the eternal kingdom, we will sit down in banquets, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and we, we will feast together with our Lord Jesus and with others. We will meet fascinating people. I mean, think of uh, Sir Isaac Newton and all, all of the believers of all time. And, and then think of Sir Isaac Newton as a man who I would think would probably uh, return to science and devote his life to glorifying God and honoring him through the development of scientific formulas and and, and perhaps scientific technology and, and everybody working together and nobody holding back information because I don't want you to get the Nobel Prize. I want to get it myself. And in total cooperation without sin, doing what God creates to do, it's as if people think we'll no longer be made in the image of God. Of course we'll be made in the image of God. That's what makes us curious. That's what makes us creative. And, and that's what is going to make heaven such a great adventure. And by the way, if you think heaven is uh, bo going to be boring, it shows you that you think God is boring. Because, and he's not. He is the most fascinating and creative uh, individual uh, in the universe by far. I love the idea that we're learning in heaven. I actually think it'd be boring if we all of a sudden knew everything. I mean, you and it I would. research and think and love books. They're such a pleasure in learning experientially. That's one of the kind of joys. Now, as you were talking, I thought, you know, what if Isaac Newton was an introvert and gets to heaven and everybody's like, I want Newton's time or Moses is an <laughs> introvert. That would almost make heaven like hell for people who need space. Now, you don't have to answer that. Obviously, that's a little bit of speculation. But uh, let me jump to this question that I know people are thinking about. I get at, This might be the most common one I get asked. Are there animals in heaven? We don't know whether there are animals in the present heaven, except Scripture does say that when Christ returns, there will be horses. Now, some people say that's a figure of speech, not literally horses. Uh, but I think there could be horses in heaven now. I would say if there are horses in heaven now, then it would only make sense that there would be other animals. I mean, why just horses, right? Um, uh, however, we know for sure that there will be uh, animals on the new earth because Isaiah 60 uh, and Isaiah 11, and especially Isaiah 60, is specifically quoted twice in Revelation 21 and 22, showing that it is a new earth passage. It's not just a millennial passage because, see, the millennium is done in uh, at the end of Revelation 20, there's final judgment. The thousand year reign is over. Now, new heavens and new earth. And now, verses from Isaiah 60 are applied specifically to the new earth. Well, read Isaiah 60, and you've got camels, and you've got a number of other animals that are referred to in there. And then all of the passages like Isaiah 65 that talks about the the lion, the lamb, the wolf, the ox, uh, and the, the lion will eat straw like an ox. He won't be a predator anymore. It'll go back to being what it was before the curse where death and predatory behavior entered into animals just as it entered into people. But they will lie down together and be at peace and a little child will be with them and so will there be animals? Absolutely. Then the next question people ask is, will those animals, some of them be our pets? And I think Romans 8 really hits on that because it says that we groan and the creation groans with us. We are not the only ones groaning under the suffering of the curse. And then it says, not only we, but the whole creation longs mm. for, thirsts for, looks forward to, the redemption of our bodies, the redemption of God's children. What that means, I think, is just as the whole creation, including animals, 
fell on our coattails, so in the resurrection, the whole creation will rise on our coattails, including mm -hmm. many animals. Well, that passage is talking about animals that suffered in this world, not brand new animals, but that went through suffering and they groan and long. Mm -hmm. Well, that means there are some animals alive today in the world that will be there. Maybe many animals, I would think it would be many, that will be there with us. And why not our pets that God knows mean, in many cases, so much to us? That's such an interesting response. And you're right, that is the next question on my list was, will we see our pets in heaven? When I think about animals, I think about they're in God's good creation before sin. God saves right. them on the ark. They're used as a part of the sacrificial system. Now, some of our non-Christian friends would say that's cruel, but you and I would say they are a type of Christ used to cover our sin. Right, exactly. There's teaching in the Old Testament to care for animals. Just read through the Bible. They show up everywhere. I mean, God is depicted as a lion and a kind of bird. They're a good part of God's good creation. I can't imagine there wouldn't be animals in heaven. Now, when it comes to pets, I'm not an animal guy. I don't have a pet. Neither is my wife. So I'd be happy if there weren't. But I'm reminded of what uh, Dennis Prager said. He goes, if you don't love animals, there might be a character deficit in you. So maybe I'll get to heaven and realize, man, that was one area where my character fell short. So if you don't want animals, when you get there, you're going to grow in a way to appreciate God's good creation. But I Right. There's some, people who, yeah, there's some people who have a, a fear of the ocean. Uh, mm -hmm. They have a, a fear of, of swimming out in water. They have th there's all kinds of dislikes, mm -hmm. phobias, or just just indifferences that we have to God's creation right now. But I don't. I think, and that's true of me. It's true of everybody. It's just that we have different things. But I don't think we'll have any of those. I'm sure we will have none. Mm -hmm. There'll be no no more sorrow. There's no more shame. No more sin. No more suffering. I think no more anxiety, no more mm -hmm. uneasiness. And so when it talks about these animals lying down with each other and next to children and all of that, Nancy, who, who does love, had, did love animals in this life, uh, said, hey, I, I want in God's kingdom, I, I want, uh, I, I've asked him, don't, don't uh, give me the job of ruling over people. I would like to take care of animals. And that's a very biblical thing. That was one of the first responsibilities that was given to Adam and Eve wow. to care for the animals. And so I think in the world to come, uh, you know, I can imagine one day um, that when I go to visit Nancy, that it will be down by the water, she says, where she wants 100 dogs and she wants, you know, dolphins and she wants all of that. And she says, you know, and of course I know God may not choose to give that to me. He'll just give me whatever's best. But honestly, that's what I'm asking for. <laughs> I love that. that. That's a great way to think about it. Uh, here's a, all these questions are, are serious, but one of the questions, a friend of mine who was a skeptic has since come to faith. His dad had died by this point not believing in God. And he asked me very sincerely, he said, how could I get to heaven and enjoy heaven when my own father would be in hell? And I realize there's an academic theology response I could give, but I thought this is such a personal question. I get it. So in general, how could we enjoy heaven knowing that our loved ones are not there? Well, I think there's a few different, there's no answer that is going to settle the heart and the soul. Hmm. Uh, I know what it is to lose people that as far as I know, were not saved when they die. One thing I would say is this. We don't know um, what happens to people in the final seconds before they die. Um, we see the thief on the cross who, at least in the final minutes or at most an hour or two before he dies, um, comes to faith in Christ. And Jesus immediately says, um, um, you know, today you, sh you shall be with me in paradise. Uh, I think there are, uh, are any number of people um, who... Um, in the final moments before death may take the gospel that has been shared with them and cry out. And how long does it take to come to faith in Christ? So there's, there's always that hope. And I'm not saying we would count on that. I'm just saying that that is a possibility. But the second thing I would say is that God is certainly capable of uh, 
uh, of selectively uh, removing or obscuring some of our memories, if that's what it would take for us to be fully happy in heaven. Or uh, we could remember, but be so, have so much of the eternal perspective of God himself that we could accept the reality that justice has been done. And another, another thing I would throw in is I, I really believe that uh, when the person, and Lewis talked about this a bit, but when a person rejects Christ, that they would not be at home in heaven. They would not like heaven at all. They're not certainly not going to like hell. But as time goes on, if God truly withdraws his presence, and Thessalonians talks about being absent from the presence of the Lord, if he withdraws his presence, and, and, and he's uh, omnipresent, so when he does that selectively, what will that mean? Will it mean that the image of God in a person is just diminished to the point that mm -hmm. maybe it disappears? And uh, in the great divorce, uh, you see kind of that concept, uh, as Lewis talks about people shrinking and, and, and shriveling. And if that's the case, then everything we ever loved in non-believers, uh, whether they're family members or friends, that goodness came from God. And that goodness, if it disappears entirely, we would not even be able to recognize uh, people who have been in hell for a while. So in one sense, we could say that person who is now in hell, in one sense, is really not the person I once loved. Now, again, throw those together, and if any of them make sense, go with maybe one that does. All we know is... Hell will never trump heaven. Uh, the, the, the agonies of hell will never diminish the joy of heaven. Hmm. That's one of the best answers I've heard, Randy, and I wouldn't say that if I didn't think so. And I really appreciate that you know on certain things that we know from Scripture, but then other times we have to say, Scripture doesn't speak to this. Let's look at the range of possibilities, see which one is most reasonable, but in many ways, the point you made before, it's really a question of what we believe about the character of God. Do we believe God is good? Absolutely. Are we going to trust him? And sometimes in apologetic circles, I'll say to people, and this is a little bit of a different point, I'll say, if heaven really is real and your family is there, what would they, and your family is not there, <laughs> what would they say to you wanting your best about what you should believe? I think that's a really interesting way yeah. uh, to frame it. Another question I know you've been asked, and I've been asked this frequently. So can people sin in heaven? Why or why not? Yes, um, I, I think the answer to that is a definitive no. Uh, we are told that there will uh, be uh, no more uh, suffering, no more sorrow. Um, uh, the, and, and I think that... Uh, uh, no more death. Okay, well, we know the wages of sin is death. So if there was sin, there would be death. So the promise of no more death is uh, effectively a promise of no more sin. In addition to that, we will be, uh, we are presently, if we know Jesus, we are covered in the righteousness of Christ. Um, and we are being sanctified, hopefully, in our lives. But one day we will be glorified. Glorified is the point at which we will fully embrace. We would no more be um, prone to sin as glorified people than Christ himself is prone to sin, which, of course, he is not. Um, and uh, the way uh, that one uh, scholar put it, Paul Helm, is that once we are with Jesus, we will no longer sin, we will no longer want to sin, and we will no longer want to want to sin. Mm. And I think that makes perfect sense because I think would we, it, it, you know, think, well, well, there was temptation in that perfect place, Eden. So can't there be temptation in that perfect place in heaven? And I think the answer to that is no, because now we see through sin. I mean, Adam and Eve didn't. They didn't get it. They were deceived. We know what sin is. Sin, been there, done that never want to do it again 
It is all misery and no happiness. So even if Satan was there, which he will not be, he'll be in the lake of fire forever. But even if we could hear his voice, we would not be fooled by him. I think it's really helpful to make the point you were hinting at between external temptation is gone in heaven and our internal natures are transformed by the yes. glory of Christ. And so now that we see not with a glass darkly, but understand what we consider the smallest sin and how devastating it is, the lure right. is gone. And yeah, we would absolutely. No, no more do it than I'd walk outside and chop my arm off. Like, why on earth would I do that? I wouldn't. And it's even magnified a million times in in heaven. Uh, right. And sin, sin is not just wrong. Sin is stupid. Sin is self-destructive. So when you have a complete awareness and you've experienced the destruction of sin in your life, and haven't we all experienced that? In this life, every redeemed person is a sinner saved by grace who still struggles with temptations and sins until we go home to be with the Lord. Why would we choose? You know, you could say Adam and Eve are like they didn't know better. Well, they should have obeyed God anyway. Well, we know better and we will always know better. Mm. I actually think Satan knows better. And now all he's trying to do is pull us down because he doesn't want us to go to that place and live forever with Jesus that he was evicted from. Mm. I mean, I think he has, I read the Scrutier letters and you see the way Lewis portrays it of this hatred for these slimy uh, little sludge bags, you know, human beings. And they're going to celebrate and live forever in the place that he gave up and had mm. and instead embraced eternal misery. Mm. Great way to think about it. I love how much you cite Lewis. I do that as as well. Very, very helpful. Uh, how about this one? Uh, is there marriage in heaven? Why or why not? Well, Jesus said uh, that in the resurrection, uh, people will neither marry uh, nor become married. Um, and uh, be married or become married. And so that seems pretty clear might be surprising in some respects to a lot of people. This is many people are very disappointed about this uh, mm. idea. However, the other way of putting it, and I remember sharing this with Nancy when it first occurred to me, I don't know, maybe it was when I was writing the Heaven book. I said, you know what? All these years where I've said, when people have asked, no, there will be no marriage in heaven, that's absolutely wrong. The truth is there will be one marriage in heaven, mm. Christ to his church. And that's what Ephesians 5 is saying. He's saying that our marriages on earth have at their very best served the purpose of uh, symbolizing uh, the reality that is to come, our eternal marriage with Christ. And once the uh, almost like uh, once once the true sacrifice came, Christ, there were no more, you know, um, animal sacrifices because it's all been fulfilled. And there's no more. And in the same way with our, our, our marriages, uh, you know, that they symbolized Christ on earth when we were truly godly. But there'll be no need for that. But then what I also said to Nancy that day, and she got on it right away, and we've held on to this ever since, is, you know what? We will be part of the same marriage in heaven. It's just that we'll both be part of the bride that is married to Jesus Christ, and he will be the spouse who will never let anyone down uh, and cannot let anyone down. And we will see him for who he is and enjoy our marriage with him and rejoice with each other. And I, I really believe that other than Jesus himself, Nancy will be my best friend in heaven because I think there's continuity between this life and the next. And there's many evidences of that. And so I look forward to that reality and so it doesn't cause me to despair that we will no longer have an earthly marriage. I think our friendship will be bigger and deeper and our sense of adventure together than it ever was in this life. seems to me there's at least a couple of reasons there won't be earthly marriage in heaven. Number one is marriage is about procreation amongst other things, and there won't be procreation in heaven. Second, it's a sign, an illustration pointing towards uh, our marriage as the bride of Christ, the Lamb of Christ, so to speak. So if we think about that and go, oh, we're missing out, 
again, we don't understand the goodness right. of marriage in this life is merely a sign of the beauty of being in real relationship with God and with other people. So it's, it's yeah. amazing how frequently the answers to these questions come back to understanding who God is and his goodness. Right. That really is the heart of it. Uh, all right, here's a big one for you. Are there sports in heaven? And this is somewhat personal for me, Randy. I played high school and college basketball. I could dunk a volleyball, but never a basketball. So I'm really hoping I have a resurrected body and can just dunk <laughs> in heaven and play against the best. But uh, kidding aside, do you think there'll be sports in heaven? Well, uh, again, as long as we uh, see the difference between the present heaven and the new earth. Don't know about the present heaven. I kind of think probably not, not having resurrection bodies yet. But once we have resurrection bodies, the question becomes not, well, gee, could we do something that involves the body? Well, of course we could and would. And would there be any reason? I mean, did Satan invent sports? I mean, some people might think so. I mean, you know, wives whose husbands never come away from the TV and watching sports, maybe. Sure. Uh, but, but the point is that, no, he did not. And God gave us, making us in his image, he gave us the desire to challenge our bodies. And I mean, when you watch the Olympics, I coach high school tennis, and so I'm around uh, young athletes all the time. And you just, you want to excel. I was on the phone the other day with Joe Gibbs, uh, the former NFL coach and NASCAR and all that. And he was talking about, are my son's, two of whom are now in heaven. Both of his sons are now in heaven. Both died at age 49. And uh, he said, what are they doing now? Do you think that they'll be doing sports because they love sports? And I said, you know, on the new earth, Joe, I'd be shocked if we weren't doing sports. In fact, I think it's very possible that some of us have, have not yet played our favorite sport because it, hmm. it's a game that's played somewhere else. Or maybe that isn't played anywhere yet, but will be played on the new earth. Uh, it's same thing with food. We may never have tasted our favorite food. Our taste buds are under the curse. Uh, the food we eat is under the curse. We've never known life that wasn't under the curse, but we will. So, so sports will be more glorious. Eating will be more glorious. Learning, study, reading, writing, art, uh, and music in every form will be more glorious than they've ever been all to the glory of God. And by the way, scripture says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do to all, do all to the glory of God. And when it says that it reminds us that even s small things like eating and drinking, not just really spiritual things. Like it doesn't say uh, whether you pray or share your faith or read the Bible, do all to the glory of God. No, he just eating and drinking just normal human things. You know, it's interesting that you say in heaven, our senses will be heightened. One of the things people in near death experiences frequently report is that they'll hear with a clarity they couldn't hear. Colorblind yes. people will see right. colors and blind people sometimes report seeing. So when I hear describe heaven this way, and then I see certain near death experiences that report it and they match up, I think, wow, I think there's some validity that we can bank on from those kinds of experiences. Now, right. you kind of bled into my next question, which is about eating and drinking. So it sounds like you think there will be food in heaven and drink, but does that mean we go to the bathroom in heaven? I know this sounds like a question that can be beneath us, but I've been asked this, and will that be a part of heaven and be redeemed or not, or do we just really have no idea? Yeah, well, Starting with eating and drinking, we know it for absolute sure because Jesus says seven or eight times that we'll eat together in his kingdom. He ate in his resurrection body. We are told our resurrection bodies will be like his. His is the prototype, the model. He said uh, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as I have. That means we will have flesh and bones. And whenever it talks about the banquets, there's every reason to believe those are literal eating and drinking. And I think he'll, he'll, you know, set up the seating arrangements as to who we sit by and who we get to know and who we can thank for what they did for us. Even people we've never met, like I'll, I'll want to thank Charles Spurgeon for a lot of things in his influence on my life. 
But now with the um, with the uh, question of going to the bathroom, um, I think that uh, we don't know. We don't know what bodily process uh, was like in Eden. I mean, I, I, I assume defecation and urination happened, but did it happen in a way where the body more efficiently used the food that was taken in? We know nothing about the appearance or the smell of it. We just don't know what a perfect body untouched by the curse would produce. So it could be that we will produce the same thing um, on on uh, the new earth, but it not seem like the same thing. Certainly there wouldn't be any repellent aspects to it. I was actually in a group this last week that included a professional football player, a quarterback, and, and one of the girls in the group says, well, we're not going to have to urinate in heaven. And then his immediate response was, I hope we do. You know, and it was more like the guys in the group are all getting it. Some guys really like to pee. Girls, maybe not so much usually, but hey, what the heck? <laughs> God knows. God made these bodies. We should not be ashamed of them, but we should not also assume that everything will be exactly like it is now. I think that's a great answer. I was on a panel probably 15 years ago with William and Craig, and he was asked this. And he said, you know, because he's done so much work on the resurrection, he said, we got to realize when we get to heaven, we will have perfect biological systems. He goes, right. but second, sometimes of our eating and overeating, either bad things or too much, is driven by depression, anxiety, our fallenness. So if our bodies are perfected, will we be able to eat the right amount and the right kinds according to God's good design? We can't prove that, but that sounds somewhat right. reasonable to me. I agree. Yep. So here's another question. Uh, many times I thought, man, how awesome would it be if I could fly? We've all stood over <laughs> a cliff and just looked down and be like, I want to soar like a bird. And I've heard people describe heaven that we can actually not only explore in that fashion, but the universe in these supernatural bodies. Are we reading too much into this, taking earthly desires, extend them into heaven? Or do you think we can actually fly and maybe explore the universe in some fashion? I, I don't know for sure the answer to that, but I do know that Jesus and his resurrection body appeared in a room in a, in a supernatural way where it seems like he didn't come through the door he wasn't there, and then he was there. Now, uh, is that true of his resurrection body, but won't be true of ours because he's the only God-man, and he's taking some, you know, the aspect of deity where he can do what he does. We don't know the answer to that either, but it could be that we could, could fly. I think more likely we could perfect... Uh, I did some hang gliding, not much, because I got injured fairly quickly um, when I was just about 20 years old um and oh what an experience and there's people in the columbia gorge that would come off of crown point and be going over the columbia river and watching them and and people who do that and it's in different modes today um but it's like they're flying i mean they're not flying with their body power but they're flying and they're doing it with their mind and their body in concert and i would fully expect that to be true on the new earth. Hmm. That's interesting. Now, it would be fascinating to think about if we do fly in that sense. Part of the thrill is the danger of it. And obviously right. that danger wouldn't apply. So either we remember it or there's some other ability we can just see things and appreciate the beauty in a way we can't uh, fully now. Right. And I think we could be uh, exhilarated with no sense of... Uh, fear involved. For instance, uh, one of the things Nancy and I did that she said was number one on all the things she had ever done in, out in nature is when we were over on the big island, Hawaii, and we went out to the manta rays at night. And they have lights down below and the manta rays wow. see the plankton and they come and they, they, they told us, now these manta rays, which are huge, uh, one of them was uh, 18 foot wingspan and then there were a number of them that were in the 14 to 16 foot wingspan these are big animals so they will come right at you and you're going to think they're going to hit you 
but they have this sonar thing going or whatever, and they'll just skim up. At most, they might barely brush you, but no one has ever been injured out here. Okay, so now, uh, why did we enjoy that so much? Well, if you told me, and I believed them when they said I wasn't going to get injured, but the level of exhilaration was thrilling, even though I, 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 I didn't have a fear. See, I, I think sometimes we think, well, we would have to have fear in order to be ever be thrilled. And I don't think that's true. That's, that's a great way, great way to think about it and, and super helpful. M maybe talk for a minute how our bodies are similar and or different in heaven. And first off, we didn't cover this, but you make it clear in your different writings that we have physically resurrected bodies. And I think scripture does in the new heavens and the new earth. We obviously have Jesus who has the same kind of body showing death has been defeated, but still has scars from before. Right. Uh, how are, will our bodies, and I, I guess I can imagine some people saying, I'd love to keep my same body. And a lot of people saying, I don't want my body for mm, a range yes. of different reasons and some of the pain from maybe physical pain or just other ways they're not happy with their bodies. Right. I think one way to think of it is that God will do not only what glorifies him, but what is fully good for us. And in this life, when he says he'll work all things together for good, sometimes we, we just don't see it because we live in a world that's under the curse. And those things often involve suffering, even when he's conforming us to the image of Christ. Having gone through that with Nancy the last four years, I mm. definitely relate to that. But there, it will all be different. Um, everything will be good. And so the question is not, do you like your body the way it is now? But would you like your body uh, at its best? If, if it could be right now at its best? Because we've all, you know, uh, uh, well, not we've all passed our peaks. I suppose if you're in your, say, early to mid-20s, uh, you may not have uh, passed your peak. But I'm 68, so I'm way past my peak, okay? <laughs> and I know that because I'm out there playing like my grandsons are on my tennis team. And uh, uh, I used to be better than I am, and they're getting better every day. And so I, I, I'm, I'm going like that, and then they're coming like that, and we're about – we've just about met, but – once they beat me, they will never lose to me again uh, in this life. But we're used to that. But there, hey, we will not have passed our peaks. Our peaks are still to come. The best is yet to come. And I think in terms of our bodies, I think God will take the maybe the DNA from our bodies on earth. Maybe that's key, the key to resurrection and make our bodies in the best possible form. So if somebody says, yeah, but I want to be taller. Or somebody says, yeah, but I want to be this or that. Well, for sure, our bodies in the best shape they have ever been in, in the resurrection, I, I would think that would be real. I, but I wouldn't at all be surprised, however, if we're still uh, able to exercise. You know, I mean, not just hmm. play sports and be active, but actually exercise, you know, for the good of building up uh, our bodies and uh, our muscles and our tone and will we stretch and all that. Well, those are things that we don't just do because they're necessary. Hmm. And, you know, we do them because we find satisfaction in challenging and improving our, our bodies as well as our minds. And I think that will be true forever. I hope we exercise in heaven. It might sound weird, but I actually enjoy it. I like pushing myself right. physically. But exactly. how, old, how old do you think we'll be in heaven? I think some people would say, like, Jesus was roughly 30 that's the perfect age. And there is something about 30. You have life experience. You're still strong. A lot of athletes yeah. are in their prime, depending on the sport, around their lower 30s. You're physically strong, but you just have this experience and this mindset. And then what if people die when they're two or they're six or they're eight? Would they just jump up to being 30? <laughs> what right. do you think? Yeah, St. Thomas Aquinas in, in his uh, Summa, his big systematic theology, actually said he believed that all of us will be age 33, which is what he okay. said, you know, was the age of Christ. We don't know exactly, but yeah, in that 30-ish realm, uh, because he was. Well, I don't really think that that's uh, the, probably the important point in God's eyes, but I do think that 
people who have who pass their peaks on Earth will return probably to what their bodies were at their peak, but in a resurrection body which will never grow old. Uh, it will have a parent age like Adam and Eve had a parent age when they were created, uh, but they weren't really that old, as old as they looked. And sure. and uh, yeah. but I also think that. Uh, probably those who died younger, I, I used to think, those who died younger will probably just be fast forwarded to their, their, you know, their peak age. But I've done some thinking about that. And I, I wonder if God, at least in some cases, as a reward to godly parents, his children who have lost have gone through the unthinkable thing to so many of us, but the very real thing to so many others of having had their children die. And then I think, wouldn't it be just like God on the new earth wow. to let these parents raise their children in a world without danger, hmm. without fear, without dread, no molesting, no kidnapping, no accidents where they can hurt themselves. And would that not be just like him uh, to reward uh, and, and, and in some sense repay uh, parents for the losses they experience and what joy they would have? That's really interesting. I, and I appreciate that you're saying we don't know this for right. sure. But what you're doing is you're saying here's what we know about God. And the yes. goodness he wants for us. So if it is a different way, God knows what is even better for right. us and will provide that. Right. Um, what about rewards in heaven? And and how does God gauge rewards? And I ask you a question in this sense. Sometimes people say things to me like, wow, you get to write books and you get to speak and have a YouTube channel. Like you're doing so much for God. And there's always this voice in the back of my mind that's like, you know what? I don't think God judges things on the same scale that we do i think god hmm. judges faithfulness and especially the widow who gives the littlest of what she has sometimes i feel like i'm going to get to heaven and there's going to be so many people who are going to be far more important and far greater rewards than i have because we're playing by the wrong scale so how should we think about rewards as it comes to heaven and what might that look like as far as we know when we get there well, one thing, uh, Sean, that I have learned that I need to say, even working into the subject of uh, eternal rewards, is to clarify uh, that we are not talking about uh, the works that we do contributing in any way uh, to our actual salvation. For by grace we have been saved through faith, that not of ourselves Amen. is the gift of God, not by works lest anyone should boast. That's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. But then let's not stop. Let's go on to verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do what? To do good works, which he has prepared in advance for us to walk in it, to do. So God has a lifetime of good works for which he will reward you. And, and I love that passage because then it clarifies they're not contributing to your salvation. However, they are being produced by your salvation. They are the outworking of your salvation. So most of the rewards passages um, uh, speak of crowns. Um, and crowns represent uh, what? Rulership or leadership, positions of responsibility. Kings and queens and princes and princesses and, you know, that sort of thing. Well, he is preparing us to rule the new earth, which Daniel 7, you talks about the eternal kingdom of God, uh, and there's some things in Daniel 9 that connect with it too, but that one day where his children, his heirs, will rule the earth forever. And it, and it says it several times, forever. And forever is not the same as a thousand years. So it's not simply talking about the millennium. It's the plan of God that just as he wanted Adam and Eve to rule the world, um, and, and over the animals and develop uh, technology, develop culture, which all would have happened without sin coming into the world. I'm convinced of that. It's all part of our being the image of God. In fact, the development of culture, if anything, has been stunted by 
sin. It's not like, oh, sin made us creative. No, I think it robbed us of a lot of creativity. But, but my point then is now parallel those first two chapters of Genesis with the last two chapters of Revelation. And now you have people ruling the earth to the glory of God. So Satan didn't win the victory in the garden. Mm. You know, a lot of people think, oh, okay, so people are supposed to rule the earth to the glory of God, but Satan uh, tempted, messed up the whole plan, and now the best God can do is snatch people's souls out of this world without their bodies to live forever in a disembodied state with the angels. No, he's redeeming the world itself and bringing us all back down. And that's where the rewards of ruling come in because he says, you've been faithful and little, I'll put you over much. Some will rule over five cities and some 10 cities. And, and, and maybe some will do what Nancy wants to rule over animals. You know, we'll see, but whatever it is, um, what a, what a delight it'll be. And a lot of people say, but here's the thing. Uh, yeah, but aren't, people going to be envious? No, they aren't, because envy is sin, and there will be no sin. I think we'll, we will congratulate each other when we see, oh, wow, you honored God in that way in your life, and I see the rewards you have, the treasures you've laid up in heaven, and, and what, what, a, what a joy to see that in, in others. So I, I think rewards will be wonderful, and I think the big thing is, Remember whose idea rewards is. If rewards were our idea, that would be totally inappropriate. But God is the one who says, I want to reward you. And won't ultimately the greatest of all rewards be to hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into your master's happiness. Mm. It's interesting. It's good, right? There's a sense of our character and moral state matters and faithfulness. Love that. I have two last questions for you. One is, uh, I'm guessing by your answer is that none of the questions I asked you are new. You've obviously thought about all these. Are there any questions about heaven you're just like, I don't know how to answer this. I don't know what to make of this. This still mm. keeps me up at night. Or just, are, are there any questions I didn't ask that you're still working through about the nature of heaven? Mm. Yeah, great question. Um, I was with some friends in uh, Pittsburgh the other night where a question was asked about that passage. And this isn't exactly heaven, but it's resurrection related. That passage in Matthew 27, where I often think, why do I not hear more people asking about this, where they come, you know, the bodies come out from the, the saints, tombs. Yeah. After, yeah, the saints, after uh, the death of Christ, this, the, the, the veil is rent, you know, it's even before the resurrection of Christ and they come out and they come out into the city and then we hear nothing more about them. I guess they, they continue to live and then died. And are they, <laughs> what are they doing? Do they go back to work? Are they wearing clothes? Are they, I mean, it's, it's like, wow, but whatever it is, it is somehow emphasizing the importance of the resurrection and giving a preview, I think, of, mm. of how the saints will rise one day because of the resurrection of Jesus, which was coming three days later, you know, but uh, that's not exactly right on with heaven, but it's related. Mm. It's definitely related. And that's something we tackle in our resurrection class uh, at Biola as well. Oh, uh, that's great. Last question. I'm guessing there's probably quite a few people who started this video with us have stayed to the end. And maybe when you shared about the passing of Nancy, obviously mm -hmm. felt a deep sense of grief for you, but almost maybe a sense of envy, a sense of like, mm -hmm. why can't I have that peace? Why can't I know amidst death of those I loved and have this, this fulfilled life that you're talking mm -hmm. about amidst pain and suffering? Now you right. said that goes back and that's rooted in the character of God and the confidence in heaven that this is a grounded hope. What would you say to somebody who's like, I want that hope? How do I know I'm actually going to heaven? Mm. Well, I would say this. I mean, scripture makes clear that uh, we must believe in, we must trust in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross on our behalf and in the resurrection 
confess with our mouths, God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And that's the promise. And we're told in First John, um, we can know that we have eternal life uh, based up if it depended on us, uh, we, we couldn't know because it could vacillate. Uh, but it depends on him and no one shall snatch us from the father's hand. Yeah, I give on to them eternal life. It can't be eternal life if you can lose it. I mean, it, it's got to be real, you know, it's in order to go on. But another thing I would say is this related to what I saw in my wife, Nancy, who was very close to Jesus before her ca cancer diagnosis, but who dedicated the last four years of her life to every day being in God's word <clears throat> more than ever before, though she was in it prior to that, but and then journaling. And her mm. journals, which she allowed me to read only in about the last few months before she died. Wow. And I said, wow. Nancy, these are incredible. And a lot of it was just writing out scripture, writing out great quotes from great books by A.W. Tozer, the attribute of the, uh, his book on the attributes of God, the knowledge of the holy, J.I. Packers, uh, knowing God, um, uh, Waiting on God by Andrew Murray, um, the Book of Puritan Prayers, Valley of Vision. I mean, she has written all this stuff out. And then it so soaked into her being that whenever she would write her own insights, like she, she, she'd be in Psalm 119, and she says, this verse says, uh, all things are God's servant. And then she says, thank you, Jesus, because this means my cancer is your servant wow and you are using my cancer in my life for your glory and for my good for my good now and my good forever and she said that to our grandchildren on mm. her deathbed and she said boys i know you're gonna cry i know you're gonna miss me and she died exactly one week after we had this meeting with the family exactly one week to the hour when we were in this room with her. And she, but she said, I'm going to see you again if you place your faith in Christ. And all of them have professed faith in Christ. But I mean, uh, you know, and, and, and I, I'm sure God will give me a glimpse uh, of, of what you're doing. And, and I'm sure I'll be able to pray for you because I'll know you're down there. We're not going to be ignorant in heaven. <clears throat> and I, I'll tell you, Sean, Seeing that and seeing the way then at her memorial service, and I recently did a, a message at our church where I quoted extensively from her journals. Someone came up to me afterwards and she said, we always try to get Nancy to speak to women's Bible study, but she wasn't comfortable speaking to a big group and all of that. But she spoke today as you read her words. And this is being dead yet speaks, you know, as Hebrews 11 talks about. And uh, I would just encourage people not only to be sure of your relationship with Jesus Christ, but don't wait until a terminal illness comes upon you because it may not. You may die in an accident and you may not have the advance notice Nancy and I had, but prepare yourself now to meet Jesus. And I'll tell you what will happen is the word of God will flow out of you, living waters. And, and like Jeremiah 17 and Psalm 1, the roots that go down uh, from the tree next to the fresh water of God, and you will make a difference in people's lives because they'll see something transcendent in you. Why does she have that hope? Why does she have that trust? Why is she not slightly anger, angry at or bitter at God? She knows God. That's how she prepared herself to die. She got to know him better every single day. And I had a front row seat. And I'm telling you, it was a miracle to see wow. my beloved wife, who was already godly, to become a saint in the maximum sense of the term. She was ready to meet Jesus, truly. And uh, we can live that way. Wow. I, uh, this has been one of my favorite interviews in a long time. So encouraging. But I'll tell you, the, what you just shared right now, I'm not going to forget it. One week before she passed that she would speak to her grandkids with that piece about something as physically and emotionally painful of cancer is as close, humanly speaking, to a miracle 
Mm. uh, for somebody in light of that tragedy to respond that way. Regardless, you said earlier, what matters is that God says, well done, my good and faithful servant. I know he has said that to Nancy and her life is just Mm. a testament to that. You know, I probably three or four years ago, I was interviewing my father. You've known my my dad for years. Yes, yes. Before he turned 80, I said, Dad, how do you think differently now? What's going on in your mind? And he kind of paused. He goes, you know, I think a lot more about heaven. And I I long for it. Yeah. And I never forgot that. And that was probably three or four years ago, even though I'm 46. And, you know, Lord willing, have many more decades. Find myself thinking about heaven a lot more. But to bring it full circle... Really, a lot of these questions come back to what you started with. Do we have a reasonable hope? And do Mm -hmm. we trust in the character and the goodness of God as portrayed in Scripture? That's Mm -hmm. the basis of it. So I appreciate you coming on again for our viewers. Your book, Heaven, everybody's got to read it. Even if they answer questions differently than you, fine, they got to read it. But this kind of a a coffee table one called Mm -hmm. The Promise of the New Earth takes Pretty much all the questions we looked at today, even more in uh, just kind of the quick two to three minute responses. And it hit me that I'm going to use this with my 10 year old son who has all these theological Mm. questions and just be like, son, you think there's animals in heaven? Let's read what Randy thinks and just work through these with my son to help him think Christianly. So appreciate you coming on. Hope folks will pick up your book. Before you go, friends, remember to hit subscribe. We we have some more conversations like this coming up, but we're tackling some of the biggest, toughest topics of our day. And also, uh, if you thought about studying apologetics, uh, Biola, where I teach, I teach a class on the resurrection, Randy, and some of that we talk about heaven. Teach a class on the problem of evil. And in that, part of the response is heaven. So we talked about today as a part of our training. If you've ever wanted to study apologetics, We would love to have you a part of our program and equip you to do so. Randy, every time we come on, you're so encouraging to me. Uh, Thanks for just being you and for joining us today. Likewise, Sean. Thanks so much for what you do. I'm sending people to your website all the time. So keep it up. Thanks. Love you, brother. Love you.